Hall, welcome back to the show. Thank you. I'm glad you're you're back on top of things. I I'm assuming the lapse was from moving. Yeah, a bit of that. A bit of that. Just you know what? Yes, it's moving and the residual chaos surrounding moving, including just like having my sleep schedule disrupted and being really sore and just general just generally feeling awful <laughs> pretty often i'm not gonna feel sane until we are done moving yeah i know how that is you you start putting things away and then you're like oh did i did i pack that already and oh i need a thing and where did i put it or, or did i put it somewhere do we still have that do we have it from last time we moved right oh that's just been my life for the past several days my office has now but you know it's usually filled with shelves with like nerd culture knickknacks on them and you know boxed copies of 20 year old video games on a bookshelf behind me and all that all of it's gone i'm in a bare room aside from my desk which means the acoustics are all echoey in here so that's a little weird but anyway yeah and you know you you said at the at the start oh you're on top of things again that's not really true i think I think I'm doing it this week, but I can't make any promises next week about doing the podcast. I don't know. It's going to be crazy. <laughs> no. I'm really looking forward to I'm I'm looking forward to having it behind us. Put it that way. Yeah, hopefully it'll be a step up, but getting there is it's a long right. step up. Right. And there's the other thing is that when you know you're moving, stuff tends to build up behind it it's like oh we should do this oh we don't we shouldn't do that until we move there's no sense in doing that now right we'll do this after the move and so now we have like weeks and weeks of projects stacked up you know waiting for this move to happen yeah i was gonna make dinner but you know we should wait till after the move <laughs> just have all the dinners after the move because we'll have a better kitchen so it's better to wait and we packed all the silverware anyway, so... Well, I guess we should lead off with a really nice, infuriating story. Can I tell you an infuriating story, Paul? <laughs> Please do. Alright, so this story is about Take-Two Publishing. Um, you, we, most people know them as the people who publish Grand Theft Auto and Red Dead Redemption. Those are their two big flagship titles. Sure, yeah. They've also, they also have, th they purchased the rights, I think, or optioned the rights to um, Kerbal Space Program. So they were going to be the publisher for Kerbal Space Program 2. No, they're not developing it. They're just publishing it, right? Well, that's where the, that's what the story's about. They oh, no. actually subcontracted it to an indie developer called Star Theory. They had another name a few years ago, and they've had a few modestly successful titles under their belt. Like, they've, they've shipped games, they've done successful things, but they've never had a huge breakout hit, okay? And they've recently changed their name to Star Theory, just to sort of go with the whole Kerbal Space Program thing, probably. And they've been working yeah, on it. double down on it. Right. And they've been working on it steadily since, you know, for at least a year. I don't know how long it's been in development. But last, I think, January, um, Take-Two sat down with them and said, look, we really want to buy you. And Star Theory was a little resistant. They tried to hammer out some sort of agreement on residuals and they could not come to an agreement that star theory was happy with so take two said fine then a few months later they they basically canceled the con like recently this month they canceled the contract just no more money for you we are no longer having you develop the game for us and then they spun up their own studio um, in-house and then they sent LinkedIn messages to the entire staff of Star Theory and said look you guys are gonna be out of work pretty soon so come work for us 
Oh and, no. And of course that is just the most evil bastard. You just murder the company just so you can harvest the talent. And about a third of the staff took the deal. And that's understandable. I mean, you know, it's like, okay, well, at least I'll still have a job and I'll still be working on this game that I've, I've already been working on. Although I don't know if a move was required. So that was super shitty. But Star Theory was like, all right, we can, we can do this. We're going to build a whole bunch of game demos. Like, uh, not demos, um, prototypes. We'll build a few book prototypes, and this year at GDC, we'll go and shop them around to other, po to other publishers. See if we can get somebody to bite so that we can get some funding so we don't have to close our doors. Okay. And then COVID happened, and yeah. GDC was canceled. So they just shut their doors. So this, this studio is now dead. It is out of business for good. And... Of, and finally, I think um, Take Two made. This is the part that makes me the most angry, even though this is the least damaging. Okay, they killed this business. This is a small business, and they murdered it because they wanted the staff. And now, how many people are we talking about? Like you said, a third. A couple, is that like two people or a, a couple dozen? I think. Uh, of oh, I yeah. think the That's staff is a small. couple. Yeah, I, I think the staff is a couple dozen people. Uh, I, don't quote me on that, but that's just the the number that jumped to my head. I, 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 I'm not going to go and, and track it down now. But I think it's somewhere in that ballpark. This is a small studio. But what really just absolutely lit my fuse is their announcement of this. It's like, this was a really hard decision for us. And I was like, just like, fuck you! Okay, that's my own. I hate that. I hate that so bad is the fake. To me, this is like the mob asks you for money. You say no. They burn down your business. And then they come around the next day and are like, man, it's a real shame what happened to your business. Like that. That is just so infuriating to me. That just gets under my skin. <laughs> Or if, like, a, a mob boss who was running for mayor, right? And he's like, it was a hard decision to burn down Billy's Bakery, but we had, we had to do it. We had to do it for the city and for the people. Right. It, this was the best move for everybody involved. And they also, and they blamed, yeah, this was a difficult situation brought about by the recent pandemic. And it's like, this has nothing to do with the pandemic. Somebody else had something you wanted, so you killed them and took their stuff. That's what happened. <laughs> oh, man. Now, how You're... can they... It seems odd to me that they could just cancel, like, the, right? the KSP development thing. Like, that seems weird. That is weird. I, I believe most contracts should have something in it that, like, we're going to pay you for this long to avoid exactly this problem of... Oh, well, we gave you a bunch of money, but now we're going to stop giving you money, but you've already invested. It, you know, it's like um, if you hire a contractor to do work around your house, um, you, you can't just like say, well, I'm, you know, you're, I've decided to not have you do this work that you've already done halfway. And, and you're like, but I've already done half of it. Are you going to? Like, we, there was an opportunity cost here. I could have taken another job, but I took the job you offered. And it, usually yeah, a contract... I, I guess it depends on how Star Theory was getting paid. Like, if right. if they're getting paid per week or whatever, like, you pay your contractor per week, and then you're like, oh, I've decided to go with someone else, like, he's still been paid up to that point. But it seems like Star Theory was in more of a position of, like, they were, they were business partners in a way. Like, they were doing this work... Yeah, they're getting paid a little bit right now, but they're hoping to make a lot more when the game comes out. And so it's like they've got some sort right. of investment in this. Right. And, I mean, I guess Take-Two just has tons of leverage in this situation. So there was no, there was no legal recourse for, 
for poor star theory. And the other thing that just absolutely just makes me grind my teeth is that Take Two is absolutely drowning in cash. Like, they did not need to do... They run Grand Theft Auto Online, which is this giant... You know, they have Grand Theft Auto V, which is the most profitable thing ever made by humans, right? Like, any movie, any book, anywhere, you put it up against any other piece of entertainment, any one product, any one thing that has been made, nothing else made more than Grand Theft Auto V. I don't know if that's still true, but that was true, you know the year it was released. Um, just made so many billions of dollars. And since then, they've turned it into this gross, pay-to-win thing, you know, real-time transactions for this, you know, giant toxic murder machine that they're running. And they're swimming in cash. And that they would take the time out of their day to destroy such a tiny developer is just sort of the grossest, you know, a billionaire beating up a homeless guy. <laughs> kind of, that's how, how, how bad the imbalance was here. And, and that's just ridiculous. Like, if you guys really want to make, if you guys really want to make a space game, you can do it. You just hire a big bunch of talented people and make whatever space game you want. But no, we, you already, in fact, you already have the license to Kerbal Space Program. Why did you need to destroy Star Theory? Just like, so petty. I guess, I, looking at it from the other side it, as a possibility, right? I mean, it does look bad, but it's possible that Star Theory wasn't doing a good job and, and take two is like, look, we, we realize that you're trying, but you're not doing a good job. So we're going to take over. We're going to make, you know, we're going to make this happen correctly. And we need you to work with us. And Star Theory is like, no, we're doing great. There's nothing wrong. Everything's going well. And they're like, well, I'm like, how can we work with you if you're obviously lying to us? Right. Okay. I will. Yeah, I suppose that's possible. It still looks really, really bad. <laughs> oh, yeah. No it's... argument. Looks bad. Yeah. The, the optics are horrible. So that was my complaint. That was my long, sad tale. Um, but what I've been looking forward to is hearing what you think of Abduction, because you've apparently been playing it. I have been. Uh, it's, for background, it's the next game, not in the Myst series, but by the developers of Myst, who yeah. uh, I think it's the only game they've made that wasn't a missed game i for for context i was really into this game i played it for a long time but then i got to a certain point in the game and bounced off of it very hard oh now, interesting i wonder if i've got there yet yeah i wonder too <laughs> um okay, well so my impressions so far are uh, that it's a little bit pretentious, I guess. Uh, well, I mean, you already said that when you bad, said it was by but... the. You already said that when you said it was by the people that made Mist. <laughs> but it's you know it's a weird it's a weird way like like the witness comes off kind of pretentious, but it's mm -hmm. so subtle about it that it's. I don't know. It, it, it's a weird kind of thing. It's a weird game. And I, I'm not quite sure what to make of it. Um, the the gameplay-wise, the main thing that is annoying is that there are a lot of puzzles that take a long time to execute. Like, walking around takes a while. Driving the little laser cart around takes a while. Uh, right. A lot of things, you push the button, you have to wait for the thing to finish. And having just played the Myst games, like, you can't just press escape and skip all that animation, like in Myst. Uh, you have to sit through it every right. time. The part that got me was, you know, you get to the point of the game where you go to other worlds or whatever. Have you gotten to that yet? I have, yeah, where you're 
they're abducting with sphere thingers and pushing the button. Yeah. And I got to the part where you have to do... In order to solve a puzzle, you have to do like seven of those in a row. Yeah. Did you get and, through that yet? And that wouldn't be that wouldn't be too bad. Yeah, they, they have kind of like Towers of Hanoi kind of thing. It's not Towers of Hanoi, but it's that kind of feeling where you're like, okay, I got to do this switcheroo, and then I got to go to the next thing and switch that, and I got to do the switcheroo again, and then I got to do a thing and rotate it, and then do the switcheroo again. It was the big uh, rotating puzzle with the little pieces that rotate inside it, right? Yep. Yeah. And even getting there, you had to do that same kind of thing where you have to move the spheres around and stuff. And it wouldn't be... It wouldn't be that bad, except that even on my state-of-the-art top-end gaming PC, it takes like 20 seconds to, to do yeah. the, the animation thing. And it's not, I don't know what it's doing. Is it loading? What is it loading? Like, how does it take so long to load? I've got plenty of memory. Can't I just crank it up and have the whole thing in memory all the time? I don't understand what's going on here. Yeah, that's what killed the game for me, is just those loading screens. They were just pure torture. And, oh, that was just so bad. And I, I really liked some of the game. I really liked some of the puzzles. I remember you had to start a train. You had to get a train engine running. I remember I really enjoyed that puzzle for whatever reason. Like, I want to go back to the game and do that puzzle again. Because I think I've forgotten it, so I'll be able to enjoy it a second time. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, and it had the little interface with the switch, and you got to set it up to to put the fuel in and then pump the fuel, and it was yep. a, yeah, it was a fun. It, uh, none of the puzzles have felt very challenging so far. They've all felt like like look at everything, take notes on. Oh, well, that's another really annoying thing. So in the game, they have a screenshot function where you can take a photo. And it's spacebar, so like whenever you try to jump over something, you instead take a photo, <laughs> and that's fine, I guess. Uh, I, I I don't need that photo of the edge of the cliff, but but now I have it forever. Um, but th the annoying thing is that when you want to take a note on something, it's like okay, well I can you know do it on my sheet of paper here on my desk, or I could just use the in-game system. But like the the uh, titular abduction animation thing, getting from the screenshot to the game and vice versa takes a long time. Like, you hit escape, and it doesn't just, like, snap, bring up the menu. It does this long fade out, and then it does a fade in of the menu. And it's like, okay, I'm sure that someone felt very clever figuring out how to do that, but I want to see my screenshot. And so then you click on the screenshot button, and it's like, okay, let's fade into the screenshot menu. And then you have to click on the one that you want to look at, and then it fades into that one. And then it's like, okay, well, now I now I can see the thing I want to look at. Thank you. But now I have to get back yeah. to the game, and I have to remember what it is that I just looked at, because it's got some sort of weird sigil, or like a, a, a symbol of something, or like it's a map. And like, I'm pretty good at remembering patterns and stuff, so it wasn't a big problem, but it was still onerous. And so then I'm like, alright, fine. Escape, and so I escape back to the menu, another fade out, and then resume game, another fade out. And it's like, ah, oh, guys, you're killing me. Why is this so hard? And it, it's annoying. It's even more annoying because I just played, oh, what was it? Quern. And in Quern, you can take a photo. Now, it's not a, a direct screenshot. It does like a, a sketch. You're like making a sketch in your sketchbook. But then when you go to your sketchbook, it keeps that page open, and it's like a it's just like a single key press. You press a key, bam, your sketchbook is open. And it's right there on the sketch that you're looking at. And like you can turn the pages or whatever. But when you go back to the game, you're it's just a single operation. You, so you can flip back and forth between looking at your sketchbook and looking at the game. And it's like, okay, that's that's much better. Now, it was Corn was made later. So, I mean, maybe they developed on top of the screenshot thing. But but like it feels like the the whole abduction thing was made as a demonstration of how cool they could make it look instead of how easy and enjoyable it would be to play. Yeah. They sacrificed usability for visuals, which probably isn't the best choice to make in a mist style puzzle game. Well, and that's another weird thing is like 
they really are kind of keeping to the spirit of the games, because Myst was one of the first very high fidelity, you know, pre-rendered games that were available. So, like, for the time, the visuals were stunning. Yeah. But that's not why people keep playing it. Like, I played it again, and I didn't play it for the stunning visuals. The visuals were fine. They were very serviceable. But I was playing it for the ambiance and for the 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 puzzles and for the the feeling of walking around this abandoned island it's this you know immersion in that setting so it's it's more the setting than the visuals the visuals are important to sell the setting but like the important thing is the setting and i don't know it, abduction felt like they had forgotten the setting or i don't know because it's not bad like that's the thing it's not bad it's just it's just the 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 good graphics are getting in the way instead of helping instead of ushering you into the world they're kind of standing in your way of the world and I feel like um, it's kind of it's kind of kind of summed up in the when you first get to this uh, I forget the name of the world Hanar or whatever uh, there's this little um, this little display thing like a hologram. And it's like, hey, welcome to this place. And it has this long string of, like, saying welcome in all these different languages. And it's cute. But, like, in the time that it took them... It, in the time that it took me to stand there and watch that thing, I could have just walked into the town and looked around and figured out what was going up. Like, it, it was an introduction that prevented me from introducing myself. It, and it made it too explicit. Like, it, it's... Right. I don't know. Right, and those early games were pretty good about um, show instead of tell. Yeah. And and it's not... I keep saying this, but it's not bad. It's just like, it's not as good as it used to be. It's not as... And, right. And it's easy to say, oh, well, you know, I've got a lot of nostalgia, but I just played these games. I just bought all the missed games and I just played not all of them but I, like I played a number of them and it's it's following that same pattern of like mist and riven were excellent and then they started explaining things and then they started have characters in the game explaining things to you and then they started having like introductory videos playing on hologram things introducing you to all the people here and it's like oh, I if I wanted to have my hand held, I'd just watch a movie. Like, it, this isn't... Right. This isn't right. the experience I came here for. Right, especially in these type of puzzle games. Like, that that sense of mystery and suspense and what should I be doing? Like, that curiosity is the mood of these games. So anything that that dampens your curiosity and makes the world more familiar and less strange and alien is is sort of eroding what makes these games special which that's a shame and i did like how they explained the not explained but like they had little notebooks lying around that were talking about oh here's the different aliens and here's how they they live and here's how they communicate and here's up with this thing and up, what's up with that thing and and you know here's technical notebooks about like how this uh, this hologram thing works and like it's all very it feels like there was a lot of thought put into it but it i don't know it's it's not it, it it's not engaging enough to get me through the tediousness of trying to interact with it a shame yeah so i've had it for over a week now and i, I haven't beat it I, I played a few hours and uh got a ways in i know that there's another thing because there's like the tree and that you can see like the tunnels going down to the roots of the tree and it talks about like the trees so probably there's going to be like some sort of meta thing where you're like abducting whole landscapes back and forth or something and um, I'm sure that it, that will be fascinating, but probably I'm just going to watch a Let's Play on YouTube. Oh, that would have been, I should have done that. 
I should have done that. I was interested enough in the game. Of course, I don't remember it now. But I remember just stepping away from the game and, and sort of wondering what I was missing. It didn't occur to me to, yeah, look it up on YouTube. So, here's a fun, have you been interested in what SpaceX has been doing lately? I have. I, I watched the launch the other day, the, the Crew Dragon, I think, yes. capsule. Yes, I did too. I watched it live. And I don't usually watch stuff live, but boy, the first... This was like the first time Americans went into space on their own without hitching a ride with somebody else since the end of the space, uh, the space shuttle program, like 10 years ago, right? Yeah, 11 years, I think. Oh, and so that was, that was a big deal. It felt sort of embarrassing that it was like, oh, we've discovered space travel again. <laughs> it's like we have to, it's like playing a 4X game, but like we lost one of our previous techs and we had to research it again. <laughs> yeah. So, I was watching a, an interview with um, one of the astronauts, not the ones that, that just went to this space station, but one of the other NASA astronauts, and he talked about how NASA kind of had to cancel the shuttle program so that they could right. use the funding that they were dumping into that to develop new technologies you know, that were more efficient. Um, but yeah, it still felt kind of weird. Where it's like, they, and another thing is, I I was there. I mean, I wasn't in space, but I was the space shuttle um, Challenger, was it, or which? What was the one that blew up over Texas? Columbia. Col Columbia must have been the one over Texas. Challenger was. Um, Challenger was no, was when I was really small. Yes, I remember yes. seeing that yeah. too. Like I was really small, and uh, I think he was in. 80 anyway i was i was uh in east texas when um columbia exploded on re-entry and like i heard the explosion and i looked up and like there it was so that was kind wow. of a, connected with it yeah wow my my connection to challenger was that i i was home from you know everybody oh my parents generation all knew where knows where they were when they heard that jfk died um, I know where I was. I was home from school the day Challenger blew up. And I was just sitting there watching, you know, dumb bullshit daytime television. So I was right there when they said, oh, we're cutting away from this for a special report. And I just sat there for like the next three hours. Wow. Yeah, so that was, that was really something. But then I heard at school a lot of classrooms, like they just stopped teaching, rolled the TV into the classroom and watch the news just just see what happens anyway. yeah well i know a lot of people were a lot of schools were watching the launch because there was a school teacher on board right terry mcauliffe ah well so now we're back in space yay <laughs> yay um so i watched the spacex launch and i could not get over how fake the capsule looked like, I, I it's just it's it looks fake because we have all these expectations of what spacecraft should look like, and those are all based on the shit we built back in the seventies and eighties, right? Okay, yeah, we yeah. All know toggle the, switches uh, and big heavy yeah. consoles. Right, it should be a panel of just buttons with absolutely opaque acronyms over each one of them. That's what a console should look like. And these guys are in, in front of a couple of, of you know, just flat screen displays. And there's nothing else. The cabin's like this bare thing. It doesn't have toggle switches and levers and breakers and all of this heavy equipment. It's just these two screens. And it was inescapable to me that, you know, if I was making a low-budget movie... That's probably, you know, that's all you can afford to do. All right, put a couple of screens there and some some lazy boys for everybody to sit in. Yeah, take and your we'll office chair and kind of kind of rig it up to recline and and right. get some motorcycle helmets on and you're 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 gone. Your spaceship now. Right. And the 
the Dragon Space Cry, I forget what the capsule is called, but it doesn't look that far from that. It was just so empty that it was just... And, and they were also using a lens, I think, that made the space look a little bigger. Probably just so that yeah, we could a, see... Yeah, there's a wide-angle lens in between the seats right. and from, looking from behind. Right. And that makes it easier to see, you know, stuff. But it also creates this this sensation of them flying around in this big, empty moving, movie set. <laughs> and it was just... It was just such a funny feeling. It looked so fake. It also, yeah. it felt weird. It felt weird. It was like, boy, this feels so corporate. I'm, why? And it's like, all right, we're saying goodbye to, what is it, Bob and Doug? Yeah. And and Bob and Doug on their way to space. And it's like, that makes them sound like a morning show. Welcome back to Bob and Doug on 105 The Fuzz. And it's like, wait, you're not a, you're, you're not a movie team you're you're not a, a deep morning drive team you're you know everybody says has more formal names for astronauts they're usually captain something or lieutenant something or whatever and they've got we right, normally right. Make, you know captain buzz aldrin they didn't just call him buzz yeah here comes buzz he's landed on the it's like it's just so Weird, the, the whole aesthetics of it are different because it's corporate instead of vaguely military, like like NASA's feels. Yeah, yeah. It was it was much more relaxed and familiar. Right. And that actually made me nervous. I'm like, oh, oh please, just to, you you come to just hope that. The fact that it is so different and that it is this corporate designed instead of government designed that it's not just going to blow up on the lunch, but like, like it shouldn't have anything to do with it. They're both made by engineers. How it was paid for shouldn't matter. But the fact that things were different made me antsy as an engineer myself. I'm just like, oh, you changed a lot of things about the way you go to space. Right. Yeah, and they're Pretty calling weird. them the Space Dads, and it's like, oh, man. <laughs> dads in space. <laughs> right. Everything about it felt so weird. Because it just, it feels weird because it's not like the launches I remember as a kid. But it worked. And they went yeah. up there. And, and the booster landed. Yes, the booster landed. They really, really need to fix the problem where, I mean, we understand why it happens. Just as the booster's landing, it's pushing the platform out of alignment so that it can't continue to broadcast satellite. But it has this side effect that if you're watching the live stream, you don't get to see it touch down. Yeah. <laughs> that makes me crazy. Fix that. Please fix that. They really just need to have a, a, like a time tape delay or something on there. So that it records right. it and then broadcasts. And it's like, well, it's not exactly live, but at least we can see it now. Right. That that's the perfect solution. Because that always because that's what I want to see. That's like the oh yeah, that's the moment that feels good when it when it lands when it clicks home, and you don't get that because it cuts out. It feels like they censored so, the best part of it. <laughs> Yeah, and and here we are. We're coming in. They're about to contact, and no, look away, folks. <laughs> so my wife and my sister, uh, this is the first SpaceX launch that they have seen. Like they didn't watch any of the the Dragon Heavy launches, any of the the cargo missions, any of that stuff. And so uh, afterward, we all were back together. They they had, were over at a friend's house watching, and I was at home alone, and. Uh, we all got back together afterward, and they're like, Paul, isn't that amazing how they can, like, land the rocket and it, like, turns around and lands on its rocket engine? And I was like, you guys, have, did you not know they've been doing this? Yeah, for a few years now. And it's beautiful. Yeah. Oh, it's it's gorgeous. And, it, like, it was kind of fun because, because they were all excited about it. And I was like, oh, yeah, for me, like, 
I've been watching him do this, so it's kind of gotten old. It's like, oh yeah, whatever. But no, that really is amazing. Like it, it rejuvenated this this amazement in me. We're just like, that's incredible. How do they do that? It's so cool. Right. When it's coming into landing and the and the platform is so small you can't even see it. But that rocket knows exactly where it's going and it's going to hit that tiny postage stamp target in the middle of that vast ocean that's oh it makes me so and, happy and not only does it land on the barge but it lands right in the middle of the circle on the barge like it, it's right? just dead nuts <laughs> on <laughs> it's so awesome yeah it makes me really happy very satisfying well uh what do you say we do some mailbags all right we're due hello diecast oh Long one, and I forgot to highlight the main uh, question in this because I've not been doing my job. Anyway, this person is talking about why so much AI has to cheat. In so many games, just you turn up the difficulty, and instead of getting smarter, the AI just cheats harder. And they acknowledge uh, the entire text of this email will be um, in the show notes if you want to read it. But I will just read the end. I fully understand why good AI is so rare and challenging to implement, as well as the game designer's dilemma that AI that was genuinely really good probably wouldn't be all that fun to play against either. The ubiquity of aggressively stupid AIs that cheat like hell suggests that's the best trade-off for designers to take, but designers don't always make the best choices. Can you think of AIs in games from any genres that you found particularly memorable? Challenging, devious at times, quite dastardly, but still clearly fair and playing by the rules. Regards, Mobius. I can think of one. Do you, do you have one, Paul? Or do you want a minute to think? I have one in mind as well. All right, you go. The one that came to mind for me uh, is something that I wish more games would do. Uh, and that's having the AI play on your team. And... Uh, Though it's in uh, Planetary Annihilation, it's a real-time strategy game, and uh, you can in the what is it the oh, I think in multiplayer too you can have a a commander that's run by an AI on your team, um, but then also in the campaign mode you can go through and and collect sub commanders and they're basically just AIs that are on your team and help you out and. Uh, that was that was really cool and, and like in my book that's just great because there's so much micromanagement that happens in a lot of these games that I would I would be hard pressed to be able to functionally control all the things that need to be controlled and it seems like there should be some amount of autonomy in the units themselves like it seems weird to have like oh I'm this robot controlling all these other robots but none of the other robots have any of the the motivation that I do. Like, you know, they're not going to do anything useful for me. They're just going to sit there until I tell them what to do. And so it gave that feeling of like, oh, you know, my robots are actually doing stuff. And and uh, having that AI in my team helped to to make it make more sense. All right. Uh, my choice for the for the particularly good and memorable AI is fear. I know this. A lot of people talk about the the AI in this game. I have not played Fear. What what kind of a game is it? All right, it is a. It's kind of a, a weird. It's it fancies itself. It, it's a first person shooter where you just mow down military guys for the most part, but it's styled like a horror film, and it's got lots of spooky stuff. And so there's a little bit of dissonance where you're supposed to be this super soldier, but you're also supposed to be scared. And they kind of pulled it off. That's a weird tightrope to walk. And for me, it worked. But um, the idea is that all the soldiers you're fighting aren't really people. They're just sort of these husks of people that were that were grown as clones and are controlled by this malevolent intelligence. Mm. And they, now a lot of the, the, a lot of people 
credit this game with being some of the best team AI. And at the time, I was like, oh, this AI is so smart. It was, it was, you're used to just, they all stand in front of you and you gun them down. But looking at it years later, I think we should give a lot of credit to the level designers and the animators. One of the things that makes them seem so smart is the way they're constantly trying to get in behind you or around you. And that usually means like, oh, they'll crawl through this thing to get into the room with you. And, oh, they'll go through, you know, he'll go up a ladder to try and get up on the catwalk and drop down behind you. And everybody's like, oh, it's so smart. And it's like, well, really, really, that's not smart so much as somebody took the time to build the level to make lots of ways to move around and to give all the animations so that they could do that. But those two, but that mobility, that unusual mobility, instead of them just standing behind cover and, you know, popping up like whack-a-mole to take pot shots at, the fact that they moved around and they reacted to what you were doing. You know, oh, he just took out half our squad or whatever. They said things out loud to each other. Um, and that made them feel very real and very alive. And I'll bet the AI code wasn't necessarily that much more complex than the AI code we have today. But the dressing that was on top of it that made their movements seem more realistic and human-like are what made it feel smart. And it's brilliant design work, everybody loved it, and nobody's tried to do it since, or nobody's done it successfully since. Like, that, that oh, was the man. most... Yeah, this was 2005, and it's the most interesting AI I've ever faced. Like, it really kept me on my toes, and that's one of the reasons I think the game was scary, is you never felt like, okay, um... I'm I'm in this corner and I'm shooting at them. It's like, oh, I've a grenade or something makes me leave my safe place. And so I move forward a little bit to pick off some more guys, but then a guy, you know, comes through the window into the room at me and blindsides me. And it's like, oh, oh, now I have a problem. <laughs> and then while I'm taking care of him, the other guys move in. Right. So yeah, they see you're not facing him anymore. You're not laying down covering fire, and so they take advantage of it. That's cool. Right. Right. And I'm not even sure. Sometimes they will just leave cover on their own. So it might even be an accident that when I looked away from them, that's when they came out of cover. It could have been like there. There's a lot of moments in that game that's like feels really smart, or it could have been an accident. You don't know, but it feels organic, and it was so good. It was so good and kept the game so interesting. Now, does fear have different difficulty settings? I'm sure it does, although I'm sure it's also... I mean, it's been, it's been over a decade since I've played it. And I'm sure also that it just, like, cranks up their damage and lowers your ability. You know, it's not like they get smarter. Right, right. It was kind of the, the question that the... the um... Who is this You're asking this question? Mobius. Mobius is asking is like, have you seen any games where the AI gets better instead of just gets more cash, essentially, right? Right. And I don't know if there's, I don't know if I've run into that. I know, okay, I know on the original Planetary Annihilation that the AI did not cheat or mm, I'm fairly certain that it didn't cheat but that they coded a smart enough AI that it was essentially impossible to beat. And so for Planetary Annihilation Titans, um, they tuned it back so that even the hardest AI is not actually that smart anymore. Huh. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that, that's another thing, is I think shooters are an e have an easier time than real-time strategy games. Reading the terrain and knowing how to balance output and doing all those logistics can be really difficult to solve in a generalized sense. On the other hand, it's almost like you start with perfect AI. You know, a shooter AI 
is flawless and unbeatable <laughs> until you make right. it make enough until you make it so okay you're going to miss 80 percent of the time right or or but, if you try to do some sort of camouflage in the game where like in, in player knows battlegrounds it's actually a challenge to recognize the other players because they can blend in with the environment or if they're not moving or if they're a long ways away it's hard to see where they are and so either the the ai just gets access to the the raw information and and can see right through you know it's got x-ray vision or whatever in which case yeah it's basically cheating because it's not playing by the same rules that the player the human players are playing by or it's got some sort of system that prevents it from seeing things in which case it's like well how how far do you dial that up like because right. then it's just a handicap essentially Right. And the other way to, to keep your AIs from looking stupid is by having an asymmetrical game. Like in Factorio, it's you, nobody complains about how dumb the aliens are. It's like, well, the, you're not, it's not like you're playing as a group of a aliens and you're fighting against a different group of aliens. And you're, they're not out there trying to build a base like the way you are. They're doing something totally different. Um, right. Where in, in Civilization, you are explicitly supposed to be playing the same game as the AI, but then you look and it's like, oh, you're definitely not. <laughs> the game they're playing <laughs> is very different. I think it's Prince, maybe, where the AI has the same resources as the human players. There's a, there's one difficulty level where they're they're basically playing on an even footing. Prince, that maybe that's the default. I don't know. Yeah, so you know th that's the real trick is making AIs interesting in a gr in a game where you're supposed to be playing on a level playing where it feels like you're supposed to be on a level playing field, but it's you're obviously not. So, and then there's games like um, like Noida, which I we both played recently, that has the AIs in the game that are playing essentially the same game as you. Like they they have the same kind of weapons, they do the same kind of damage. Uh, they even have line of sight things where they can't see you if they haven't been there before. Uh, they can pick up wands and use them just like you. Now they're not very smart about using them sometimes. But, right. Uh, it's kind of it's kind of a neat thing that they are that they are really playing the same game and in some ways are actually almost as good as the player. I mean, like the player is going to succeed not because the AI is being stupid, but just because they are much more powerful than the individual characters in right. the that the AI is controlling. Right. Yeah. Now, it would be interesting if they could make a smart AI that could say, reason about the environment and realize, oh, Instead of shooting at the player, I'll shoot at the at the ceiling above them, and then the poison in the reservoir above them will spill all over the all over them or whatever, you know. Right. Like that would be. Would that be cool? I think it would be cool. You know, know, it would be cool the first few times it happens, but then that would make them really dangerous, and I think it would incentivize the player to always sort of drain everything that they come in, that they they come into contact with you'd have to take yeah. precautions and that might get really tedious the player also doesn't take damage from physics objects so there's that advantage where you can just like bring down the ceiling and you'll be fine and all the enemies will get crushed i didn't know that i always i always assumed i'd be crushed so i like i had a weapon that created rocks and I never used it. I was always terrified of dropping it on myself. You know, or <laughs> like yeah. dropping it on some enemies, but it rolls off of them and onto me, and then I'd die. All right. Let's do the next one. Paul? Hi, Seamus and Paul. Uh, this is also a long question, so I'll just read a little ways down. Uh, now, what I've been wondering about is... What kind of difficulty is particularly tough on you, or rather, are there genres that you have an easier time with than others? 
And then uh, way at the end, they give kind of a TLDR. What kind of factors, such as game mechanics, difficulty, design, game length, pacing, weak story or writing, weak atmosphere, uninteresting setting, etc., contribute to you personally, your personal difficulty threshold, especially in regards to some recently mentioned titles, such as Dark Souls and Doom Eternal? Greetings, Wave of Kittens. All right. For me, I mean, I've, I've written about this on the blog. Maybe this email was sent before that article. But for me, the, the one thing I really can't tolerate is, you know, um, punishing gameplay where you're, you know, okay, I'm fighting a boss and then I lose and now I'm not allowed to immediately retry the boss. I have to go and do something else for a while. Walk back to it from a long distance or fight some other stuff to get to the boss again or watch a cutscene or whatever. Um, and it's not just boss fights. Boss fights just are a good example of, you know, of this in action. But it can be with any sort of singular, unique challenge that, you know, I'm trying to overcome or master. And when I'm, when I'm taken away from it, and it takes a long time to get back to it, I, I can't handle it. I get too angry. I get too frustrated. Um... And that's really the big thing for me. Paul, what, what, uh... I don't know. I, I don't generally, well, let's see. Difficulty in games. Um, I guess RNG, where I, where I don't understand the, the, the randomness, or, or there's too much randomness, I feel like it's out of my control. That makes it not... I mean, it does make it difficult to play, but it also makes it difficult for me to feel motivated to play. Um, something like Dota Underlords or something like that, where there's a lot of randomness in, in the things that you're dealt or you're you're collecting things, and and it's hard to to know what you're going to get, and so you have to kind of plan on this vague. Well, if I get this, then I'll have a contingency for this, and if I get this, I'll have a contingency for that, and uh, it doesn't feel I don't know. It doesn't feel engaging to me. And there's too much randomness. I have that same um, problem with randomness. In fact, there was a game I was playing today. Oh, it was... Um, it was. I had it in the show notes to talk about, and then I decided against it. But I played a game called Despotism 3K. And it's, it's sort of a roguelike where... Um, you're playing as the evil computer and you've enslaved a bunch of humans and you need to have them, you know, build power or generate electricity for you and, and food for themselves and whatever. Okay. And sure. I, I loved the idea. I thought it was so funny, this idea for the, the game. And, but, the real, a huge part of the game is sometimes you'll get random events and they're pop culture references. Like, oh, this guy wanders into your base. Like, a lot of people wander into your base. And one of them is a guy with me mechanical arms. And it doesn't say it's Doc Ock, but you can tell from the description, oh, this is supposed to be Dr. Octopus. Or this is supposed to be Neo from The Matrix. Like, this one guy... N-E-O-H. Neo wanders in <laughs> and and it offers you multiple choice of what do you want to do? And like one of the choices is make a red pill and a blue pill. Poison both of them and ask him to choose which one he wants to take. Uh -huh. and, and so it's like, oh, that's cute. You saw a movie. And there's no way to... There is no rhyme or reason. They are completely random. Like, I, at first I thought, all right, you have to be able to get the reference. And then you'll get the good outcome. Because sometimes the setbacks are really severe. I mean, this is a... Um, this is a... A roguelike type game where you're just... Your goal is to survive as long as possible. And some of them are like, well, this is going to hamper your power generation by 18%. And it's like, well, that's that's death. I mean, it won't happen now, but like three days from now, 
that will be enough to just completely run me out of power. I, I will now enter a death spiral that I have now just entered a death spiral that will take three days to kill me because of this one wrong choice from a random, there was no way to guess the proper, and, and the game's kind of just so cute about it, like, haha, that was the wrong thing, and now this horrible thing happened to you. Oh well, moving on, and it's like, that, that was very boring to me, knowing that really getting ahead or falling behind means memorizing the right answer for dozens and dozens of pop culture quizzes. That where yeah. you have no idea what the right answer is, and that killed the game for me. But I wouldn't say that that made it hard, although I guess it does. I, I wouldn't have filed that under difficulty, but I think the way this person is has framed the question, that would make it hard. It certainly made it hard to continue playing. I'm sure there are a lot of other things that make a game hard for me to play, but I don't play that many games these days, and so I'm I'm pretty careful about not just jumping into something that's half-baked or, or weird or, you know, like a experimental thing. So I, I probably right. don't expose myself to a lot of those things that would otherwise come up as answers to the question. But that's a, that's a very interesting question. All right. Last one, I think. Hello, Seamus and Paul. Since 2009, I have belonged to a group that has been attempting to create a free private server for the NCSoft MMO Tabula Rasa. It has been a difficult process because NCSoft continues to issue cease and desist orders for a game that was shut down 11 years ago. Do you think historical preservation is important for online games such as this? Why or why not? May all your hits be crits. Leslie Beldotti. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, an important additional bit of context. Um, 11 years ago, Leslie bought this game for me. Uh, <laughs> Well, um, she, this was way before I had like had a formal system. I forget how it worked, but this was before that was a common thing. And this was before I got review copies of stuff. So this was an interesting thing. Somebody got me a game and I played it for a while, but I think it didn't last that long. I don't remember how long the game ran, but it was not long. I don't even think it lasted a year. Tabula Rasa is, uh, the phrase is like the blank slate, right? Correct. Uh, the and idea so is this was like an you... MMO where you have to build the whole MMO yourself? No, it was like humanity was starting over because of the alien invasion or whatever, but we're developing superpowers, but something. Um, hmm. I don't remember. It's been 11 years, and it didn't super grip me at the time. Like, I wasn't just enthralled with this lore. But it was it was an early experimental... It was a shooter MMO. Um, which was unusual back then. You before know, trying Destiny. to do... Right, right, way before Destiny. And this was back, you know, in the heyday of WoW. Back when the internet was still a little laggy to be doing real-time shooting. <laughs> right. And you could you could feel it. You could definitely feel it. it. The shooting felt a little weird sometimes. It was an interesting game. I didn't fall in love with it. But anyway, I am fascinated that people are still trying to resurrect this thing. Um, I am definitely come down on the side of preservation. And I think it's uh, absolutely outrageous. No, th it's legal. I'm not saying they're breaking the law. But I think it's absolutely outrageous that NCSoft is sending cease and desist orders to people trying to... In my book, they threw this MMO out. They threw it away in the garbage. And then the community came along, fished through their garbage, and pulled it out of the garbage. And they're like, no, no, no. You're not allowed to have that. Leave it there. Like, you don't want it. Um, so that's really a shame, and I think it's incredibly short-sighted and destructive to the hobby. Just, we, we should preserve this. I mean, 
Think about how many movies managed to get lost to time, or even early television shows, because nobody thought to, and how much we would love to have access to them today. But they either weren't recorded, or the recordings were destroyed, and we are all poorer for it. And so this must have been one of the MMOs yeah. that had all the server info client side. Because otherwise, it seems like it would be impossible to recreate it, right? Right. I'm not sure. How do you re reverse engineer? I mean, I guess some people have just figured it out. Um, yeah. How do you how do you, how do you do that? I don't know. And Leslie can't send us a link because otherwise, NCSoft will track her down. Right. Well. I mean, you could, if you decompile the source, this is super la labor intense, or not the source, if you decompile the executable, you will get this really rough, really impossible to read source code, which if you squint at it long enough, you might be able to make sense of it. I mean, really, you need to look at the networking code, and if you can isolate that, then you can see what the networking is doing on the client side and use that to give yourself a framework to work with on to make the server. It can be done, but boy, that's hard. I can't believe anybody went to that much trouble to recreate this game. But yeah, I I, I think yeah, I, I really think it's important to preserve the past. I would even prefer it like I think it should just be standard practice. When you shut down an MMO, give the community your source. If you don't want it anymore, then allow it to live on as open source. There's no reason not to do yeah. that. Well, there, well, I mean, I mean there are reasons. Obviously, there there's, are reasons. Yeah. There, there, <laughs> there's reasons, that, but none of them are good. I mean, it's like, if you do that, you will not be harmed as a company. You Probably... Just, just put it in the license agreement. You're allowed to use this as long as you don't profit from it. It's got to be, you know, community supported through donations or, or whatever. But it has to be free. You, you can't turn a profit using this. That would just be the right thing to do. Yeah, it's, I don't know, intellectual property stuff. It's, I don't know. I don't think we should get in that conversation. But it is, um, it is a shame that it's so difficult to keep using software that you've paid for to have access to um, that companies just decide that they don't want to let you use anymore. Right. And this gets really um, abusive. Like there was the game APB. It was a cops versus robbers MMO. It ran, it was sold for $60 and it ran for 90 days. It's the shortest lived MMO ever created. Um, they spent a fortune on it and it made like no money and they just shut it down right away. But it was, it went out of business so fast. It got shut down so fast. It was still on store shelves for $60 when the servers oh, went away. Oh no. And this was back in the day when you couldn't do returns anywhere. So you could buy this thing, get it home, and the servers were gone. And you wouldn't be able to take it back to Walmart. They wouldn't accept it. You were just... They Ugh. just took $60 from you for nothing. Um, so, yeah. There's that. Uh, and it sort of drives me crazy, these... These companies that are like, no, no, we have intellectual, we have to defend our intellectual property. We might, there could be a loss. This could be worth something someday. There's some conceivable future where where having people running tabula rasa servers might harm us some way in the future. Therefore, we can't let this happen. Oh, but you shut it down. You, there's also a risk that people could be, you know, they paid you money and, and now they don't get a product. <laughs> And they're like, well, that's tough. That's how it works. <laughs> it's like so, so jealously guarding their theoretical future income that they're willing to just basically steal your current income. It's very evil and very selfish and very short-sighted. 
And that's why I only play single-player games. Yeah, there's a good policy. Uh, I mean, the multiplayer games are really fun, but it is it is that weird weird thing with the, who owns what and who's, who's responsible for keeping this thing running. Because it is expensive. Like, you can't just do this for free. And... Yeah. And it is dangerous to release your source code like if you've got a bunch of stuff that you worked on and you want to be able to use in other games in the future and you don't want your competition to get a hold of because it's going to give them competitive advantage it you know like it's it's costly to to release your source code so i understand where they're coming from but at the same time like especially in this case where it's 11 years ago like none of that tech is cutting edge anymore none right. of it's going to help anyone out like the reason that they're sending cease and desist orders is because it's someone's job to send out cease and desist orders for people yep. who are violating intellectual property laws and like they're just doing their job and like that's all they do all day they don't care if it they don't care if their job is pointless or if it isn't benefiting the company that's what they're paid to do and that's what you see in a lot of companies um, once they hire, once they have a legal staff instead of they have lawyers that they hire when they need them, they have a full-time legal staff, then when there's nothing going on, they'll just spend all day chasing kids out of, you know, out of interesting projects, sending C&Ds to Harassing their harmless... former customers. Right. <laughs> sending C&Ds to harmless people that aren't threatening the company at all. Uh, it seems like you'd want to keep your legal team on a very short leash. It really does. Maybe there's a reason I'm not running a company. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure, but maybe we've done a show. We've, we've certainly got... done something for the last hour. We've still got quite a few emails here, but they will have to wait until next week. Thanks to everybody who sent in questions. If you have a question for the show, the email is diecast at SeamusYoung.com. Now, say goodbye, Paul. I wish I had prepared something. I had two weeks, but I didn't do anything. Uh, goodbye. <laughs>